It's this inner doctor that we can tap into. It's part, it's our birthright. There's an art to this. There's an art and science, but the art is we have to figure out like what's the best way to use this tool. Welcome to the Food Matters Podcast, your home for health and wellness. My name is James Colhoun, filmmaker and founder of foodmatters.com, and I am your host on this journey to inner and outer transformation. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to take a short moment to talk to you about the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, because studying nutrition completely changed my life. It helped me to heal my father, get him off six different medications, lose 50 pounds, and completely regain and transform his life and health. But the problem is, is that we're not really taught about nutrition in our schooling system. The medical profession is rarely pronouncing the facts of using nutrition as medicine. And we have a fast food industry that thrives off misleading consumers. So if you're looking to learn about how to use nutrition as medicine to either heal yourself or a loved one or help prevent chronic disease, or you want to take that next step on your study and nutrition journey and become a certified nutrition coach, then the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program is for you. This is a 10-week or self-paced internationally accredited certification program designed to take you through some of the most important topics on the la and the latest research when it comes to nutrition and natural healing, including gut healing, autoimmune conditions, balancing hormones naturally, detoxification, biochemical individual approaches to nutrition, plus it brings together the best that we know about uh, nutrition science and anthropological research and bringing these two approaches together to help you cut through the confusion about what to eat and what to avoid for optimum health. To find out more about the nutrition certification program, plus to download your curriculum guide, head to foodmatters.com forward slash study. You can pause this right now. It will only take you 30 seconds. That's foodmatters.com forward slash study, or you can head to the show notes for more information. Have a beautiful day. Hey everyone, it's James here and I'm with Dr. Will Cole. Dr. Cole is a functional medicine doctor. He has been named one of the top 50 functional and integrative doctors in the nation. And you may know of his name because he uh, was one of the co-hosts of Gwyneth Paltrow's Lifestyle Brands uh, Goop's first spin-off podcast, the Goop Fellas podcast. He is the bestseller of Keto, Ketarian, Ketoarian, The Inflammation Spectrum, and the New York Times bestseller, Intuitive Fasting. And today, we're going to be talking about that latter topic, Intuitive Fasting. Hey, Dr. Will, how are you? Hey, I know Ketotarian's a mouthful. I, I apologize yeah. for that. But hey, it's a, you know, it's a, it's like a meta, it's a play on words, right? Ketotarian, like sort of a vegetarian leaning it's really like a mediterranean ketogenic diet but in hindsight it's funny the publishers actually said they're like that's kind of hard to, to pronounce but it came out a few years ago you can't do anything about it <laughs> but yeah but anyways thanks yeah. for having me i'm excited to talk with you about all the things same and look on that topic i think there's so many like spin-off blended diets and and to me it 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 adds it adds uh, a cohesion to the to the space because there is so much confusion and so much people living on the spectrum mm -hmm. the ends of these spectrums you know I speak about this idea qualitarian you know where there's like a focus on quality mm -hmm. you know and so I'm I'm happy you did that because I think it continues to push and open new ideas so for our listeners. How did you get started in this? Like what was your entry or your foray into functional medicine and into, you know, this sort of keto with a plant-based spin, Mediterranean and now intuitive fasting sort of vibe? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's the books are really just outer representations or like in book form, different conversations that I have with my patients in functional medicine. So I have patients on all different types of food protocols and all other different types of, of different wellness, biohacking, natural medicine, supplement protocols. And that's the heart of what I do. It, it's, it's bio-individuality. And we're all different with different baselines for our health, different goals, and then different preferences. <laughs> so the conversation that I was having in Ketotarian was 
okay, but for both the plant-based world and the keto world, how can we optimize this way of eating? And not to say that I think everybody should be eating this way. I don't think that. And if it, and, you know, if someone reads the book, they'll see in all the books I talk about, let's find out what your body loves and what your body hates. Let's find out your preferences. So it was a way to teach plant-based people, okay, how can you be less of like a carb fiend and like a sugar addict like it, that's disguised as sort of this wellnessy thing? And then on this flip side, ha- on the keto world, just because it's hashtag keto and tons of bacon and butter for long term sustainable health, is that the, that's not the best way to go about it either? So how can you really opt instead of? either or can it be both and and sort of a whole food like you said nutrient density that quality uh, of food matters more than any labels so um it was really educating people about how you can do a higher fat higher healthier fat moderate protein lower carbohydrate approach using whole foods as a way to support metabolic flexibility and then same way with any of my other books, Inflammation Spectrum or Intuitive Fasting, these are just conversations that I have with patients. It's like, okay, this would be a good conversation within a book because it keeps coming up with my clinical practice. So how I got into this, to answer your question, it, it is, I've always been a health nerd. I, I used my paychecks when I was in high school. <laughs> I realized what, in hindsight, what a weird kid that I was, but I would use my paychecks to go to the health food store <laughs> and, and buy like the random superfood that I read about or... Uh, yeah. Check out this next like this herbal uh, remedy that that had a lot of cool science around it. I was biohacking before there was even a term for it, and I was at 16 years old doing this. So then that evolved to me wanting to be formally trained in this, and I started one of the first functional medicine telehealth centers in the world over 12 years ago. So this is basically all that I've done. I've been in this room. They let me out from time to time to see my wife and kids. But basically, I just stay here from sunup to sundown (laughs) talking to people around the world about their health. And I get to run labs. We ship labs where they're at. I just live and breathe this stuff. I'm immensely passionate about it. And it's a sacred responsibility for me to me for to be there for my patients in this way. So this is, that's my story. That's how I got here. That's so beautiful. I love it. And I mean, that commitment to purpose um, and that sacred calling and 12 years, I mean, amazing. Well done. Uh, The world certainly needs it. And I know that you and I both see that and, you know, that's a beautiful thing. So I love, I love that. And Thanks. also being so early to telemedicine, I think is such a gift to the world. Um, there is a fair bit of, you know, the face-to-face art of someone's energy, but there is so much that can be done, especially when you have the level of knowledge that you have over a phone consult where you can actually start to drill into mm-hmm. what, what some of the core issues are. I have a question just really for people Mm -hmm. that are not so familiar with functional medicine, like early on when we first started producing films in this space, probably about 15 years ago, um, you know, the, the perception of functional medicine, integrative medicine, naturopaths, nutritionists was almost like you would be seeing somebody with, um, like we call them like tracksuit pants. Uh, it's been a few years since I've lived in the States. So like, uh, like sweatpants holding like crystals in their backyard, like going, "Mm, let me read your aura field, you know, to, to now, you know, functional medicine is like a top tier approach. It's like when, when everything else fails, this is like probably the most, you know, the, the, the best thing to, to be, to be doing. It's got, it's got a much better sort of PR spin on it now. What, where, where has functional medicine come from? I mean, early days, people like Jeff Bland from Metagenics that were really sort of early voices in this space to where we are today and what how does it differ differ from from conventional medicine yeah you're right i i you know i and i've seen a lot change over the past 12 years being in telehealth and functional medicine specifically and you know there was no functional medicine center at the cleveland clinic now there is and now not just the cleveland clinic but lots of mainstream conventional hospitals and medical institutions now have functional medicine centers. And it's really, I I mean, I think the science and the data and the results speak for themselves, speak for itself. And this is why people that are still living 
antiquated, like with that old school mindset that it's somehow woo woo or quackery. These hospitals would not open up multi million dollar functional medicine centers based off of quackery. They have to realize that they are on the wrong side of history to still be think, seeing functional medicine like this. They, uh, this is very much the new age of, of healthcare. Um, and it's very slow to be integrated, but we are being integrated because again, the results speak for itself. And it's not either or again, it's just like with ketotarian, it, this sort of reductive toxic tribalism, tribalism that's within wellness, but it's also within medicine, you know, and, and seeing what it's like conventional medicine versus alternatives uh, or complementary or integrative medicine. It should not be either or. It should be both and. And we should have the best of both worlds to serve people. And a heart of functional medicine, again, is bioindividuality. And so I am collaborating with conventional GPs and endocrinologists and rheumatologists and gastroenterologists and neurologists to provide the best healthcare in the world. Um, so I, that's really what functional medicine is. It's collaborative. But if I had to boil it down to what I do is a first thing we interpret labs using a thinner reference range. So anybody that's listening to this or watching this now will know when I get my lab, I'm seeing this number on a piece of paper or on online on the portal. And then I'm being compared to this reference range. We get that reference range largely from a statistical bell curve average of people who go to labs. People that are predominantly going to labs, sadly, are people with health problems. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of people, especially women, that know intuitively something's off here, like this, mm -hmm. whatever symptom, this inflammatory symptom, this digestive problem, this hormonal problem, hair loss, uh, fatigue, they're experiencing it and it's real. But they go mm -hmm. to the doctor and the doctor largely will run the basic labs and then they'll say, look, everything looks pretty normal. You're just depressed. Here's an antidepressant or you're just stressed mm -hmm. out or you're just getting older or you just need to lose weight or you're just a new mom. All of these sort of well-intentioned reasons as to how you could be having these symptoms despite these quote unquote normal labs. What they're unintentionally telling the person is that they're a lot like the other people with health problems that they're being compared to in that reference range. Mm -hmm. And in functional medicine, com comparing yourself to someone with health problems is no way for you to find out why you feel the way that you do. Mm -hmm. So in functional medicine, we're looking at optimal, not average. Where does vibrant wellness reside, which is going to be a thinner range of interval of numbers within that larger reference range. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at optimal health and where your body is functioning the best. That's where we get our name. It's, it's, it's the functional range or the optimal range. So we're looking at the, the fact that, that health and health problems exist on a spectrum and that symptoms will oftentimes very much pre-exist official diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So, which that's the t really a large part of my work is really looking at this gradient confluence of variables that need to be understood to ex understand why we feel the way that we do. And then we run more comprehensive labs to look at the data. So we're looking at underlying gut problems or chronic infections, nutrient deficiencies, hormonal imbalances to really get a thorough data viewpoint. And then we realize we're all different. Back to my earlier statement, bio-individuality. We, we mm -hmm. curate and tailor protocols based on the individual, based on their health history, based on their labs, and then based on their preference. So that's sort of the duality of what I do is there's a science and then there's an art. And you have to hold both to be a, a uh, effective clinician. Because you if somebody hates what they're doing, but even if it's clinically appropriate on labs, then it's going to produce a completely different result than if that person with the same set of variables that they love what they do. So just really looking at a lot of the psychosocial, mental, emotional relationships that people have with themselves, with food, with wellness as a whole. So I think about these things too, too much, but that's basically what functional medicine is and how we get people healthy. I love it, Dr. Cole. And one thing that really stood out for me that you said that I hadn't really heard before is that symptoms precede labs. Um, and, you know, I, I know of so many women as well, in particular women, uh, also men. I mean, my father was actually one of one of them that present to uh, conventional medicine, have all the labs run, 
and they're basically saying, look, there's, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, but they're experiencing symptoms. They feel unwell. And I, I think it's fueling this whole, um, mystery illness, you know, idea where people are like, we, we don't know exactly what's wrong with you. And so sort of conventional medicine throws you out and, or prescribes you psychotropics, which is so common. You know, you look at, you know, SSRI antidepressant, um, prescription rates in the, in the Western developed world. And it's, it's, it's pretty sad. So, I mean, I think that's such a beautiful concept that functional medicine is able to sort of dig a little deeper, look at the person. And I've, I've always been so attracted to that and it felt natural. Um, and, and it feels like a great, I don't even want to say complimentary approach because that diminishes its power. Um, I, I feel like, and we always think, I mean, there's always been this perception of alternative medicine or complementary medicine being like on the side or the last port of call, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. early on when yeah, we did the Food yeah. Matters documentary, we were interviewing people like Charlotte Gerson and then going to these clinics in Mexico and, and just looking at that cancer story. And people that were going there, it was their last chance. They'd been given two or three months to live. They'd basically eaten horribly and done all the wrong things their whole life and then been told to get their finances in order. And the, the medical profession didn't say change their diet. And yet they, they, they go to these, you know, these clinics. And, and it's sad that it's become like a bit of a last port of call. But I guess you're starting to see more people take it as a first step. I'm assuming so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I see, I've seen a lot of changes over the past 12 plus years. It's really becoming more uh, people are realizing that they have choice in their healthcare, mm -hmm. and they're wanting answers. Um, so yeah, I see people on all points of their journey. I see people earlier on. I see less of that. Sadly, still, it's still an issue. But I, I would say I see people earlier on. I wouldn't say early on, but I see I get to see some people earlier on in their journey because of honestly, I think the democratization of health information, podcasts like yours, and mm -hmm. conversations that people are having, documentaries that maybe see on uh, in different places that they'll know. Oh, okay. I didn't know this was a thing. I, I want yeah. this. I, I need to, f f I need to find out why I feel the way that I do so I can do something about it. Nice. I agree. That's good. We're, we're entering a new world, <laughs> uh, hopefully fast enough. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, fasting and inflammation. I mean, these two topics are, you know, quite hot front and center. I know with our audience, there's been a huge appetite for learning more about, uh, what causes inflammation and how to bring inflammation down in the body because it's it's a it's a big issue. Um, so I'd I'd love to speak to that. And then also, fasting has become more and more popular. It was a little bit on the edge in more biohacking, sort of like functional sports sort of scene. And now it's entering mm -hmm. a little bit mainstream. And then women used to think, well, I'm that's not for me. But then now it's sort of starting to become a little bit of a thing. Um, Talk to me about how inflammation and fasting became sort of front and center for you and, and, and why, why you put, paid so much attention to it. Yeah, I mean, it's a major part of my people, the people that I spend my time with. They're m mainly people with different autoimmune problems. So mm -hmm. there's really not an autoimmune problem out there that is not overtly inflammatory or at least has inflammatory components to it. And re science recognizes today upwards of 100 different autoimmune conditions. And then there's about a 40 above that 100 that at least have an autoimmune component. So the most notable are um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common. Uh, autoimmune thyroiditis is number one as far as the amount of people that have it. It was also the first, I believe, discovered in science at the turn of the 20th century by a man named last name Hashimoto's. And People like to name diseases after them. When you do, when you try to, do, when you discover a new disease, it's like Hashimoto's and Sjogren's, and I can. There's lots of different ones. Um, Addison's disease. These right. are all different types of of uh, autoimmune conditions. But the most common ones would be autoimmune thyroiditis. Lupus is very uh, common. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, MS, uh, Crohn's disease, ul ulcerative colitis. These are different autoimmune problems. With the immune system, the researchers refer to it as losing recognition of self, which is think about that. 
think about that on a physical level, but also think about that on a mental emotional level as well, mm. losing recognition of self. And it's when there's a lack of T regulatory function and the immune system starts to cross react and attack the body, something called molecular mimicry. When the immune system uh, is it's sort of the case of mistaken identity when the immune system's tagging different parts of the body, whether it be the thyroid or the joints or the gut or the myelin sheath, depending on what you're talking about as a virus or pathogen and is attacking it. So um, to inflammation's a commonality between just about every problem, not just autoimmune problems, but really the commonality between every health problem under the sun. I mean, whether you're mm -hmm. talking about an autoimmune problem or a metabolic condition like type 2 diabetes, cancer, or you're dealing with um, brain health problems. I mean, there's a whole field of research, really, it's referred to as the cytokine model of cognitive function. And cytokines are pro-inflammatory cells. So it's researchers looking at inflammatory components to things like anxiety and depression and brain fog and fatigue and other neurodegenerative problems. And a lot of my work is really in educating people the fact that mental health is not separate from physical health. Mental health is physical health. Our brain is a part of our body just as much as anything else is, our pancreas, our spleen, and our brain is one of the organs too. So this yeah. sort of relegation of mental health as sort of this abstract conceptual quote unquote chemical imbalance. <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, what's causing the chemical imbalance? Is that a colleague of mine, Dr. Amon said, to me once yeah. he said psychiatry is the only field of medicine that doesn't look at the organ it's treating and that's the <laughs> functional medicine perspective on this is that we should be measuring we should be we should be uh, be evidence-based and quantify what is going on from a neurological standpoint or whatever else we're talking about so we look at inflammation and other neurological biomarkers to gauge brain health for people that have brain health problems so that's really inflammation is the woven, like it is the commonality between all of these problems. So the question is, what's driving the inflammation? Because it's the commonality, but ultimately something's causing the inflammation. There's nothing inherently wrong with inflammation. Inflammation is a product of our immune system. We need proper inflammatory responses to fight off viruses, to kill off pathogens. But the when we're talking about inflammation, what we're in the, in the sense of, in the context of chronic diseases, it's chronic inflammation. That is what's not good. It's inflammation out of balance. It's the, mm. the forest fire that, that is burning in perpetuity. That is mm. the issue. It is a, a breaking of the Goldilocks principle, right? Homeostasis. You don't want it too high. You don't want it too low. You want it just right when you need it. So inflammation, chronic inflammation is infl inflammation, inflammation too high for too long. And that is what's linked to all of these different things that I talked about. But my job in functional medicine is to find out what's driving it. So through health history, through labs, we can look at the components that are contributing factors to their chronic inflammation. And fasting, the second part of your question is fasting is one tool to attenuate chronic inflammation. That's a mm. great way to lower inflammation. Okay. Wow. I mean, the way that you just described how inflammation impacts all those illnesses is profound. And obviously I'm a huge fan of Dr. Daniel Amen and, and many great, um, psychiatrists that have done work, Abram Hoffer and others that are focusing on how do we focus on that organ and help support it. I think that's really beautiful. Uh, and the success they get speaks to their approach. Um, so when people think about lowering inflammation, they typically think about eating certain things or avoiding certain things. I don't think people's mind typically goes to not eating anything. Um, how did that come about? How did that come about for you? That that understanding of that research. I mean, where where did that exist? And did you look historically at at this story of um, of fasting, like a, as a species, it's been something that's been imposed externally often um, and or something that's been religiously followed. Did you sort of merge those together or just look at the science and go, wow, when we don't eat, it brings down inflammation markers. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so it's something in my personal life, I mentioned being that weird teenager. I read a book uh, when I was about 16 years old. Um, called patient heal thyself it was written by jordan rubin if you if you know him but yeah. i have in years like now i know him personally and i mm -hmm. i 
told him when I was a teenager, I, your book, it was before it was even published. It was like a self-published sort of thing. And I said, like, this book changed my life. And he said, thanks for making me feel so old because (laughs) he just changed my life. But anyway, so there was a great book and he talked about many things, but one of it is using fasting to calm inflammation. Mm. So that was really my first awareness in modern health nerd uh, literature uh, in the nineties. So that I then in being sort of, if you know anything about the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram five. So I'm like this voracious reader and researcher and kind of motivated by that. So then really digging into the research, I fasted since I was a teenager. Now I'm in my late thirties and and still, so it's always been a part of my personal life, but then to be a functional medicine doctor for the past 12 plus years to put them, put it into patients' lives and build protocols, fasting protocols, and really curate tailored fasting experiences for people is a major role, a play to, to, to move the needle in a positive direction. But there's an art to this. There's an art and science. The science is very clear. It's a great tool to, to bring in to support the metabolism, to support the gut brain axis, to lower inflammation levels, to support metabolic flexibility. There's a lot of compelling science, but the art is more isn't always better. The art is it's, there's definitely not a one size fits all to fasting. And we have to figure out like, what's the best way to use this tool. And there's Mm. different, different ways of doing fasting. There's intermittent fasting. There's, there's longer water fast, just different subsets beyond with with both of those uh, ways of fasting. So um, the, the, the science and the spirituality of it's always been fascinating to me because you're right. I mean, it's fasting even before we had randomized control trials and all the exciting science about it. This is something that's been part of the human landscape, both from a two different reasons. One, historically, from a food scarcity standpoint, yeah. food wasn't always available. Fat, human beings just had to fast because it was just called life, <laughs> yeah. human life. And yeah. 99% of our genetics haven't changed in 10,000 years. So think about that. Eating more in alignment with what how we evolved as a species is times of fasting. Mm. So it wasn't called like intermittent fasting. It was just called life. Yeah. And food food availability just compelled people, uh, un, you know, un, involuntarily to fast. Um, so we've decreasing the chasm between genetics and epigenetics. The you know the way our genome is, the way that our microbiome, which evolved with us, way that that our body and our microbiome is. And the world around us, decreasing that mismatch between genetics and epigenetics is a major central tenant to regaining health. So fasting is one way to decrease that chasm. Um, and, and also intentionally, like you said, spiritually, even when food was available, you could look at basically every indigenous culture around the world. They in implemented intentional times of fasting for spiritual purposes and elevating mm-hmm. certain levels of consciousness or to, or even medicinally, they would do it to heal. Mm. Um, you look at Islam with Ramadan and mm-hmm. Judaism with uh, Rosh Hashanah and uh, sorry, Yom Kippur and Tish B'Av are fasting times. You look at Christianity, Lent started out as fasting. You look at a lot of pagan cultures around the world, used it, a lot of Eastern cultures used it. So this is uh, something that's been part of our, it's really part of our heritage as humans, no matter where your ancestors came from. So it's a very, from a primal, primal ancestral side of things, it is very beautiful to um, to heal the body. And I, I think it's more eloquently summarized. There was a, a man named Paracelsus. He's known as the father of toxicology at the, I think it was the late 1400s, early 1500s in Switzerland. He's He called fasting the physician within, which mm. I think is really a succinct way of putting it it's this inner doctor that we can tap into it's part, it's our birthright mm. and if we just give our ch- body the chance to tap into this 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 inner physician wow that's such a beautiful term and did, is that where is he the doctor that named the peristaltic movement in the body or not i am not sure but <laughs> you are you are out geeking me my friend <laughs> i love that and maybe Maybe he is. I don't know. But let's figure. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. So let's circle back and put it in the show notes. You enagram <laughs> five. You enagram five. That and uh, figure that out for me. But uh, the, the, do you know what enneagram five you are? Or do you know what enneagram you are? No, I mean I've I've 
been into a few different things over the years and more of a sort of human design <laughs> thing at the moment, which so I'm like a I generator. Like you haven't one. dabbled in the Enneagram? All right. All right. Not yet, but you've. Okay, I'm, I'm, cool. I'm, I'm going to try it out. Now you have to. Yeah. Now you have to. Have you ever wondered if you can change your life and health in as little as seven days? Well, did you know that just like your body has an innate healing capacity, it also has an innate detoxification system that runs 24 seven. The detox process involves the liver as well as our elimination organs such as the bowels, urinary system, lungs, and the skin. But when these organs become overloaded, this leads to a buildup of toxins and unwanted substances in the body, which can cause symptoms such as sluggishness, bloating, unwanted weight, fatigue, skin issues, and the list goes on. Over the past 15 years, I've been fortunate enough to interview some of the world's leading authorities on detoxification and cleansing. And what has become clear to me and in my personal experience is that vegetable juicing is one of the safest, fastest, and most effective ways to transform your mind and body to help you gain mental clarity, shed excess weight, and in the quickest time possible. That is why we've created and put together the Food Matters Juice Detox. In this program, you'll receive a seven-day plan, a shopping list, 24-7 support and guidance to kickstart a lasting change for your body. And it's all backed by the incredible science of detoxification. We've curated two meal plans, one for summer and one for winter to ensure that you can comfortably detox no matter what the season or temperature. Plus, we've included a list of approved snacks and recipes that can support you on your journey. And I promise you won't starve, don't worry. With a combination of energizing juices and nourishing soups for the cooler months, this program will help you feel better than you have in years. Just like Jackie, one of our community members whose testimonial I'll share with you right now. Dear Food Matters, I'm so proud of myself. I've lost over four kilograms, which is such a great kickstart to my weight loss goal. Four kilograms is like about eight pounds if you're in the US. I have clarity, I'm not forgetting things as much, and I'm a lot more organized. I feel so much more energetic. So if you're looking for that ultimate transformation, but don't know where to begin, head to foodmatters.com forward slash juice detox to discover what makes our signature juice detox so special and exactly how it can impact your life. So this inner healer, um, I love that idea. I think one of the biggest things that awoken myself to functional medicine and in particular more the nutrition side of it what to eat what to avoid and what we're talking about day today which is like when not to eat um was you know born out of this this new idea that the body has the capability to heal itself and i think that was so revolutionary for my father which was a big catalyst in us creating food matters and then these these films and 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 so forth over the years and and i think that shift is is so powerful for people to make Uh, when they move to thinking, well, I'm a victim and I need to go take these medicines and maybe it's going to work to, wow, my body has this capacity to heal. And I hadn't heard of this Dr. Peristalsis um, before. And to say that fasting is your inner doctor, your inner healer is just profound. Mm -hmm. And I think starting to see that web of like uh, spirituality and then, you know, humans didn't have food, like you said. So, surely we've adapted to to thrive on on times of of this and i've spent the last four years living predominantly uh in in indigenous culture uh in in a remote island in in the pacific called vanuatu which is like in between fiji and and australia and traveling to many outer islands where one during COVID, they hadn't seen white people for for a long time you know many children had never seen a white person and hiking with them through the bush and and you know, planting food and kava, this like traditional beverage that they drink. Um, and, and seeing that there is just times where they just don't eat because they didn't get enough from the garden or it's a lot of work to go fish and take some crayfish in, in the evening. And you would just see children and men just not eat because it just wasn't there. And we live in such an ever ready environment. I mean, we're like, how dare lemons be out of season? Let's ship them from America to Australia. You know, how dare <laughs> yeah. we don't have mangoes year round? We need mangoes in Wisconsin yeah, right. in the middle of winter. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> ludicrous, right? And this this neurotic yeah. approach to food 
has completely disconnected us from like local in season. You go to Europe and people eat what's in season when it's not in season. Like, sorry, we don't have asparagus anymore. That was like three months ago when everything was asparagus, asparagus on toast, asparagus soup, asparagus salad, then it stops, you know? So I think there's so much that we've really screwed up in terms of the food system, which stops us from fasting, which stops us from Mm -hmm. naturally doing that. So before we go into different ideas about fasting, there's one key concept you talk about, which is this idea of intuitive fasting. Um, what does that mean and to, to you and how do you sort of, how would you explain that to people that are coming to fasting for the first time? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the title of the book is, again, it's born out of my clinical work and consulting patients. So it's a phrase that I always use clinically for the past 12 years is just there should be a mindful, flexible, check in with your body, intuitive sense to not just fasting, but lots of things. So I thought, okay, this is something, a concept that I've always talked about with patients. So I think it would be a good um, uh, a good uh, umbrella, con- like front cover for people to get what I'm trying to get across. Um, I... I plus it's from a visual standpoint, the prefix INT and intermittent fasting, I thought just looked good (laughs) from the aesthetic side of things. But basically I I didn't realize the book would piss a lot of people off because the book came out. I did piss some people off, but whatever. Um, Because the, the, the intuitive fasting community, the capital I capital E intuitive fast to have eating community, Mm -hmm. um, which I didn't really know much about. The book has nothing to do with them at all. Yeah. But it, it is just saying, I, I, I was hate to break it to that community that they don't own the word intuitive. <laughs> Other people are intuitive, not just them. So they, they thought that it was like about eating disorders, but because a lot of people that do capital I, capital E intuitive eating, mm-hmm. a book from the 90s that, yeah. that it was for disordered eating and, and all that stuff. And if that oh, works okay. for you, fantastic. Like, just more, more, but the book has nothing to do with that. And I talk about that within the first couple pages of the book. This is not about disordered eating. I have nothing to do with this, but it's about a more mindful, intuitive approach to fasting. Hmm. Because like I mentioned earlier, more isn't always better. And I think that I want people to learn the science and art of them be their own and a one experiment and see just because you heard it on a podcast, or just because you read about it in a book doesn't necessarily mean that's the exact way that you should be doing it. So what I really tried to teach people in the book as the reader is to see how do you check in with your body's cues to know how you're doing it. So when somebody's just starting off with fasting, fasting will be anything but intuitive. It will be the complete antithesis of intuitive because if someone's metabolically inflexible, their sugar burning mode, they're hangry with insatiable cravings and fatigue and all this stuff. No, fasting won't be intuitive, I, the complete opposite. But that's the goal of the book. The goal of the book is to, the analogy that I use in the book is like a proverbial yoga for your metabolism. Mm. And if somebody is inflexible on a musculoskeletal level, like I'm pretty inflexible, like if my, my hamstrings are tight. If I go to yoga, and I don't really do yoga so much anymore. I, pro- I should do more of it, but I used to do more of it. And I know if I went to the yoga class, I wouldn't be that good at it. Mm. But is it, it's, and I could blame yoga and say, yoga is not for me. You know, yoga, that, the yoga mm. thing's not for me. No, it's not yoga's fault. It's my inflexibility. It's my tight, tight hamstrings. Mm. Same with fasting. Fasting will not be intuitive for somebody that's metabolically inflexible, meaning their metabolism stuck in that sort of hangry cravings, blood sugar roller coaster, sugar burning mode. But they have to go to that beginner's yoga class for your metabolism, which is like easy time restricted feeding, a very nice entry point of fasting to start to train their metabolism to be more flexible. And just like with yoga, there's a science and art to it. There's a yogic science and there's an art to it. And you can evolve that yoga over time as you gain flexibility. Mm-hmm. And you don't even have to think about it. The, the, yoga practice, the yoga practitioner just ends up really being uh, doing their own practice. And that's what fasting is. It's a way to train your metabolism to be more, become more flexible. And over time, it becomes intuitive. And um, it's a way to really tap into that inner physician again, just mm-hmm. really take your health to the next level. Mm, nice. I mean, it's really interesting because intuitively, not 
for an eating disorder intuitive. So thank you for clarifying that. But intuitively, I resonate with fasting and I will go and fast at different times and I'll do it different ways. Sometimes it'll be in a minute. Sometimes it will be uh, like more of a juice cleanse. So I, I'm, I'm just moving away from solid foods, um, you know, and sometimes I don't feel like that. Um, but then my partner, Laurentine, she is like, I cannot go periods of time without eating. I need to eat something to stabilize my blood sugar. Otherwise I get shaky and it doesn't feel right. So she's the proverbial tight hamstring yogi, right? So, <laughs> so yeah. how, mm-hmm. how would we as two different individuals approach it? So I'm one that will fast, um, occasionally, and sometimes water fast, you know, there's a time when I had like some parasite activity and just intuitively went on to like a real herbal thing and then went to water fasting and f- literally passed something and was able to put on like another 10 kilograms in the next two or three months. So like put, which is about 20 pounds nearly. So put on, so that worked for me. Um, but h- how would you approach it to somebody who says that, fasting's not for them maybe they get real blood sugar issues they get shaky they're like if they can't if they go without food they just feel horrible how do they lean into it because i feel a lot of women fit that category probably more than men and i'm I'm making an assumption but i generally hear it more from women that they tend to think that they're not Mm -hmm. a type for for fasting yeah so and i talk about this at length in the book there's a whole chapter about that because there is especially if the female is cycling she's menstruating there is a dynamic that we need to really look at it and the way that i'd advocate it for most people long term is a cyclical flexible sort of vacillating ebbing and flowing eating and fasting windows that is intuitive um, for many different reasons preference what you have going on on the day your activity level your schedule, um, and your, if you're cycling female, your estrogen and progesterone levels. Mm. So it doesn't always have to be the same thing. And as I mentioned earlier, more isn't always better. So the entry point for people is there's a four week protocol in the book that mm-hmm. I put in the book for people to experiment and it's lean into these practices. And every week you get a bit deeper and then we loosen back up. So again, it's mm-hmm. this crescendo vacillating, ebbing, eating and fasting window that's constantly expanding and contracting. So, and then we can evolve that with menstrual cycle too. Mm-hmm. So all women are different, but you are right. There's, there's some, a lot of women, especially cause they're real read things online and or hear things. Okay. It's not for women or it, it, there's this something that women should, should look at to as, as not being right for them. And that's, we don't, there's so many <laughs> women don't need to tell me that to tell them this, but there's so many different types of women as far as their variables. Yeah. So for example, a woman that's struggling with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome or endometriosis or adenomyosis or weight loss resistance or insulin resistance or leptin resistance, she's going to completely have a different experience with intermittent fasting than a woman that does not have those problems Hmm. that is leaner maybe or she has lower thyroid problems so there's a lot of bio individuality even amongst that so Hmm. um but regardless i want them to find out their own bio individuality and being a woman is part of that and um I think a good entry point for a lot of newer people people that are newer to the concept of fasting is a 12 12 Mm-hmm. eating and fasting windows. So if there's 24 hours in the day, 12, 12 is very simple, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. It's basically what I would like is just allow a couple of hours after dinner before you go to bed at night so your body can fast through the night mm. until you break the fast at breakfast the next morning. So it's just not eating too late at night and that, that, get that fasting period through the night, which is difficult for some people because they're eating way late in the evening. Yeah. And they're, um, they are not giving their body enough time through the night to digest and really tap into that, mm. that uh, fasted zone. And there are some people that are metabolically flexible that will get trace amounts of ketones just from that alone, meaning mm. they'll tap into that fasted state. But then from there, every week we go a bit deeper and we, we explore an 18-6, which is uh, the next type of fasting I would lean into there. And you could start, you know, go to 14 or 16, but 18 would be the goal to lean into a bit more. So that's a six hour eating window. So you could do that 12 to 6 PM. Those are your eating windows, or mm-hmm. you can do that earlier in the day if you want to. 
Um, and then from there, the deeper type of fast, as far as the time restricted feeding, which these are all time, types of time compressed feeding, uh, is an OMAD, which is an acronym that stands for one meal a day. So uh, it's a little bit more flexible in the book. It's about a 20 to 22 hour fast. Mm -hmm. So you're eating between a two and four hour eating window. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost OMAD because you can really have one and a half meal in that time span. And the goal of that is to get to a deeper fasted state, get to deeper into this inner physician to support autophagy pathways, which is the cellular recycling, sort of our body's natural anti-accelerated aging pathways that really works on sirtuins and a lot of the longevity research, the deeper the ketosis is. Because fasting and eating in the way that I would advocate during this time, which is sort of a flexible ketotarian, mm -hmm. a nutrient dense, clean ketogenic way of eating, that's also cyclical. You're not always in ketosis. So the reason why is because I would never advocate someone to fast their way out of a poor diet. So food mm -hmm. is always first, which I know that's mm -hmm. what you all you know, speak so eloquently mm -hmm. about is food is first. And then from there, you can amplify the benefits of the food with some fasting windows. So that's how I pair intuitive fasting is with the sort of clean cyclical ketogenic diet that's it's not always in ketosis we're doing clean carb cycling and i talk about that at length in the book and women that are menstruating they should be doing that they shouldn't always be in deeper fasting and they shouldn't always be lower carb they should be increasing those clean carbs like fruits and tubers and gluten-free grains when when they tolerate those so that's that's the tool that those are the tools within the toolbox that i explore in the book nice amazing um, so I encourage people to, to get the book and go deeper on it because it seems like it, it definitely covers a lot of, um, approaches here. Um, I love what you said there about you cannot fast your way out of a fast food diet. <laughs> I mean, that's just such a cool concept. You know, it's, you, you can't jump from mm -hmm. something that's horrible and then eat horribly and fast at the same time to get a good result. So, you know, that, that makes sense. No. Well, yeah. And that look, and that, that is that it that can become a disordered eating right because you're like your insulin's all over the place you're hangry and then you're like i'm gonna starve myself <laughs> and that's gonna be healthy no that's that's very dysfunctional i would mm -hmm. never advocate that and none of us in the fasting state or in the wellness space that are talking about these things would ever advocate mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this is complementary to an already healthy diet mm -hmm. absolutely uh 100 agree when when we look at like you said, like, okay, so just try to eat earlier in the evening, which is, which can be difficult, especially if it's summer, which, it, uh, or if you're in Europe during summer and, you know, the sun doesn't go down to 9 PM, you know, and you're eating at 10 or 11, but then you have to just wait longer before you have your, your breakfast. But basically you're saying eat earlier before going to bed, which I think is just a sound idea. People going to bed full or after having this huge dessert or lots of fruit on top of a meal, like it, it's not great for digestion, you know? Um, and so then eating earlier before bed, sleeping, and then potentially going into that ketosis state and then waking up and breaking your fast. Now, when we think about breaking a fast in the morning, which people, which is breakfast, right? what are the common mistakes people make and what is considered still fasting? Like if I have lemon juice and water with some, you know, salt, is that still fasting? If I grate up some ginger and turmeric and squeeze it into water, am I still fasting? If I have a celery, lemon, cucumber juice, cause it's hot out and I want to sort of cool my body. Is that fasting? You know, wh where does the, where do I, where do I step on and off this train and how do you recommend people break that fast mm -hmm. in the morning in particular? Yeah, it's a good question. And normally, that, that's a very common question that I get. So a lot of people are going to want to know the answer here. And a lot of people want to know, does coffee break a fast? And then mm. they, this, the next most common question is, can I put creamer in my coffee? Will that break a fast? Because <laughs> that's what they want to know, what they can get away with. powdered the creamer so and, and, like, and the, uh, the, 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 uh, <laughs> the Splenda. Can I put the Splenda in there? You know, the yeah, aspartame? Yeah. You know? All that. Oh, man. man. There's like... There's tens of thousands of people right now that are just waiting on the edge of their seat to know what they can do in the yep. morning. But the, the reality is there's a gradient, right? There's the fasted state and then there's fasting mimicking and then there's breaking a fast. Mm -hmm. So a fasted state, the truest fasted state is going to be nothing that stimulates digestion. Like 
no added fats, no added creamers, like nothing. That's a true fasted state because your gut's having nothing but water to that will really a, a deeper ketosis, no cortisol changes, no insulin changes, uh, no gut digestion that has to happen. There's like a deeper autophagy standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's the most purest sense. And then the fasting mimicking is are things that are going to have negligible effects on insulin, mm. leptin, and mainly insulin, leptin, and the other satiety signaling pathways. So fats are an, in that category, right? So whether that be plant fats like MCT oil or animal fats like ghee or clarified butter or butter, um, something that's de no protein or small amounts of protein. And that's where I think some plant-based creamers can fall into that category of sort of a plain coconut milk or a mm. plain almond milk. Mm -hmm. We're talking about negligible amounts of protein and fats. That's going to be fasting mimicking because if you look at the research with Walter Longo and yep. you can have a decent amount of calories per day and you're still in a fasted state. Mm. And look, let me just say this, the ketogenic diet is the fasting mimicking diet. So if someone's eating a higher fat, moderate protein, lower carbohydrate approach, you're in ketosis the ketogenic diet's a path, an entry point within ketosis, which is this fasted state. It's tapping into what's known as the fourth macronutrient, which is beta hydroxybutyrate. It's the ketone that your body naturally produces. Fasting increases ketosis. The ketogenic diet increases ketosis. So is that little bit of creamer that's like coconut milk or almond milk or a full fat cream throwing you out of ketosis? No, it's not going to. It's such a small amount. It's not going to do that. Um, and then anything that's stimulating insulin or anything that's higher in protein is going to impact the benefits of fasting because once insulin goes up and blood sugar goes up, that's going to diminish the amount of ketones that are being produced. It's going to mm -hmm. decrease beta, hydro beta hydroxybutyrate. It's going to decrease that fourth macronutrient and that inner physician state. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a gradient and there's a lot of bioindividuality. Some people are more carb sensitive than others. Some people are more protein sensitive than others. There's a pathway called, I know you know about this, but for people that are newer to this, it's called mTOR, the mammalian or mechanistic target of rapamycin. That's sort of, you want mTOR to be lower in that fasted state because that is part of that inner physician. Your body's doing cleaning, it's cleaning house. It's in the autophagy, cellular recycling, cellular renewal, state mTOR during that state you want mTOR to levels to be lower mTOR pathway is sensitive to protein consumption so once you start adding more protein in it or carbs then that's going to impact mTOR insulin and leptin and all those things mm -hmm. so i would avoid that but small amounts of fat small negligible amounts of creamers and things like that i would put under the umbrella of fasting mimicking it's still mm -hmm. impacting digestion so that's not a true fasted state but it is uh, in that sort of gray area. So that's that's my uh, those those are my thoughts on, mm -hmm. on what people can get away with. So juices, I would stay clear of those. But mm -hmm. the lemon, like that, I think would be fine. Mm -hmm. It's just small amount. It's really going to have small amount in, impact on insulin. But what I do for patients is ve get very granular with the data and look at things like continuous glucose monitor and measuring mm. ketone levels as well, because some people can get away with a lot. Yeah. Some people can't. So you can see how fasting and food impacts your blood sugar and ketosis levels. And some people can have a pretty significant amount of carbs and they're still in a fasted state. Mm. Some people can't have anything and they're, they, they're thrown out of a fasted state pretty quickly mm. back to bioindividuality. So the only way you knew that know that is through labs, whether that be like actual running labs that I do for patients or at, at home devices, which we, you know, like a continuous glucose monitor or yeah. a, a ketone strips and measuring that. Great. Got it. So, um, I, I guess another question, like with continuous glucose monitoring, there was some interesting research that I, I, I came across where they were studying people that experienced anxiety and panic attacks. And one of the things that they noticed had a very strong correlation was a drop in blood sugar uh, resulted in 
a sort of a panic attack sort of situation. And so with fasting, you're saying that there's a, a strong correlation to keeping that blood sugar spike low to keep yourself in that fasting state. So if you eat certain types of carbs or, or, or sugar, then you're going to spike the blood sugar and you're going to jump out of the fasting state. And then you're saying that a, a, a ketogenic approach to eating is almost like a fasting way of eating because you're keeping that blood sugar lower. So there's a, there's a, a deeper focus on good quality fat, then protein, then carbohydrates. In practicality, you're basically saying, keep your blood sugar under control, people, right? That's, the, that's a key thing, a key theme. And then the fasting inside oh, yeah. of that. So why is that important? And then what are some of the ways that people can conceptually see this ketogenic diet if they're new to it like what does that look like on a plate for people that are probably a little bit more plant-based and then for people that are a little bit more okay with like a like a pest a, a pescatarian or a lacto over vegetarian or something like this what does it look like yeah so um it is uh there's a lot of foods you can pick from uh and so if somebody's eating this way uh and, and let me be clear on this. You don't have to, someone can do intermittent fasting. If they're eating a whole foods based diet, nutrient dense diet, focusing on quality, they could do intermittent fasting mm -hmm. with even without a ketogenic approach. But I feel like, again, you could complement the fast, even when you're not fasting with the flexible cyclical ketogenic way of eating, because you're keeping insulin low. It makes fasting a lot easier because because you are tapping into ketosis even when you're not fasting and back to nutrient density if you're doing it in a clean nutrient dense way you're fueling your body to make that fast easier on that level as well so a way that it would look like and this is if anybody that is more plant-based or omnivore in the sense of their mediterranean pescatarian leaning or i call it a vegetarian in the book <laughs> but the, the it, it is um both in ketotarian and intuitive fasting, get both of those books because those are both, that's how we eat in that book. Mm -hmm. But basically the foundation of that ketotarian triangle is things, a lot of vegan keto foods like coconut cream, coconut oil, MCT oil, coconut milk, full fat coconut milk, uh, avocados, avocado oil, olives, extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds, soaking them, making them more digestible to the, mm -hmm. to the body and less irritating to the digestive system. Um, and then the vegetarian keto foods like pasture raised organic eggs and clarified butter or ghee, and then the pescatarian keto like what fatty fish like mm -hmm. wild caught salmon and um, anchovies and sardines and other fatty fish. And then above that, you're going to get the protein, which is a lot of those foods have protein in it too. And then um, above that is going to be non-starchy vegetables, so lots of any, any vegetable that you want. And I really make a large focus on leafy greens, sauteing them down if you have digestive problems, not having lots of raw vegetables, mm -hmm. lots of soups and stews if you have digestive problems, and sulfur-rich vegetables. If you don't have um, SIBO, you can have things like you know onions and garlic and asparagus and Brussels sprouts because they talk a lot about methylation in the book, which a lot of my patients, again, have methylation gene variants to just support detoxification pathways. And then at the top of that ketotarian triangle, the smallest amount is going to be low fructose fruit, so berries and citrus and things like that. So if there's a detailed conversation within the books about fiber and not fearing fiber. And that's part of why I wrote the book is just the keto community, especially a couple of years ago, they were like a very much like fiber phobic and they were like very much anything – that could potentially decrease ketosis, they were really um, fearful of. And I think that is just, there has to be a nuanced contextual conversation about whole foods and how fiber really helps with satiety and helps with blood sugar balance and should not be feared. Um, and that's part of why I wrote the book too, because the keto community was like ab avoiding all these whole foods in the yeah. name of ketosis as this sort of utopia. But um, that's not an oversimplified view of this very you know, contextual topic. Nice. Well explained. And I love your Buddhist-esque middle path approach 
to diet because it, it's very refreshing, yes. honestly, Dr. Cole, because people love extremes because it feels safe and there's very clear guidelines. And I think that there's, uh, can be so many benefits there for people short term, like that, that, that honeymoon effect of like changing things up, but you're looking at how do we sustain long-term positive health outcomes and it doesn't exist on the fringes. It's a very integrated mm -hmm. approach. And I really love the way you speak about, you speak about diet yeah. there. So, so hundred percent on board with that. And yeah, the fiber thing, I mean, Dr. Bolshevich yes. talks a lot about that too, you know, how important fiber is for the gut um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, for balancing blood sugar. So, so really beautiful. I guess probably one question to finish up here on is, the way I see you um, just in this short interaction, I, I've really come to, to love love this. So thank you for the, for this time um, and love your approach. But but one of the things that, that that is coming through for me is that you seem to be this like middle path sort of bringing it all together guy. In mm -hmm. terms of that's great from a functional medicine perspective, but what this feels like a more of a philosophical and a spiritual approach to health. In what way do you sort of advise or work with patients um, or practices that you recommend that are non-food, non-fasting while they're doing this ketotarian in a minute or intuitive fasting approach to health? What else are you recommending they do from a non-food perspective to maybe mm -hmm. support that, that process? Yeah, you are absolutely right. I mean, again, it's for somebody that talks to patients 11 hours a day, it's like, this is what gets people healthy is looking at these things and not being super militant and super tribal about one thing. Because if I hung my hat on, this is the way that everybody should eat, I would be falling short of a lot of cases all day long. And if I, that was the hill I was going to die on. And this was like the one path for everybody. No, that's like not real. Uh, you have to look at labs. You have to look at preference. Because again, if somebody hates what they're eating, that stress and anxiety, that obsession, that negative feedback is going to produce a completely different result as, than if they love it. So our headspace is, and our heart space is a completely like important ingredients to the outcome that we're trying to achieve. And so a, a major part of my work is looking at that and I actually talk about that in intuitive fasting at length. It's, it's what I call these metaphysical meals. It's these like, what are we, you could be eating the best foods in the world, but if you're serving your body like a big juicy slice of stress every day, yeah. <laughs> that's going to spike inflammation levels and cortisol levels and throw off your blood sugar and and all just as much as that big slice of food that's going to do that, mm. like junk food or you know, some sugary junk food. So we have to realize, like, what are we serving our head and our heart just as much as what we're serving our stomachs? Like that, those are things that are very much important. But that's a lot more nebulous because it's easy to say and be prescriptive of saying, well, these foods bring inflammation levels up, do this. This is how you fast. It's very prescriptive. But it is a lot more uh, ambiguous for to talk about stress and shame and someone's relationship with food and relationship with body and like the the heart of it all is a lot more ambiguous. Mm. So it's a pra it's a practice. So for patients, we really cultivate a lot of mindfulness practices, a lot of body mind body practices, somatic therapies, and trauma work to really ground the person to create a space of awareness to really have a reckoning in a way of their relationship with themselves and the relationships they have with food and their the sustainability of how they live their life and to start making conscious choices to that are serving them so it's not this list of do's and don'ts it's about you can have whatever the hell you want but it's i want to do things that make me feel good. And I know the tools within my toolbox that make me feel good. So it's just very much this conscious, rational decision that unfolds as the person starts leaning into practices like this, starts feeling good. Cause it's hard to make conscious decisions whenever you're inflamed and have blood sugar problems and have an unhealthy gut. So we have to focus on the real, like finite clinical nutrition stuff, but 
It's the bi-directional relationship, I guess is what I'm trying to say, between our thoughts and emotions and physical health. Back to what I said earlier, mental health is physical health. Mm. So we have to deal with the thoughts and emotions and the spiritual stuff and the trauma stuff. And then we have to deal with the physical health stuff. You have to deal with both the psychological and the physiological to get sustainable changes. So that is what we do. It just takes time. You know, we're talking about patterns that have been entrenched for, for some people, generations. It's intergenerational trauma that you're really dealing with. But to really, if nothing else, it's in this lifetime, decades of doing things a certain way. So it's not a quick fix, but it's a, a sacred responsibility is how I see it, a really starting to give people the tools that they need to, to thrive. So yeah, it's very much spiritual. It's very much philosophical because that is what I've seen to be needed because it's so easy, as you're saying, to like, well, this is the way or that's the thing or all it's these these toxic tribalism and this this viciousness that happens on social media. And I just think the only people that suffer from that are the people going through it that are looking for answers. And it's, I think, really realizing that, that a lot of things have commonalities and we have to find out what your body loves back to bioindividuality. So instead of making broad sweeping overgeneralized statements like, that's all noise. It's secondary to what works for you. And that's what we need to uncover. Beautiful. I love it. Um, Dr. Will, you're a force for good. Uh, you're a force for God. You're on this like spiritual yeah. movement to bring nutrition and transformation and break in intergenerational trauma. And I love that we were able to circle back on this from a, a point that you made at the start about um, autoimmune conditions where the body is like fighting itself and hating itself and giving up on itself to bringing that sort mm -hmm. of love and connection back in. So super beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much for the work Thank that you. you do. And if people are interested in finding out more ahead, just Google Dr. Will Cole, check out his books, get some, read them. Uh, it's an amazing topic and I love how well you bring it all together. So thank you for your work. Oh my goodness. Thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. For everything that we've mentioned in today's episode, you can check out the show notes. There will be links and information there for you. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and be here for this podcast. If there's anybody that you can think of who could benefit from this information, please make sure to share it with them. We believe in the power of life-changing information, and it's especially powerful when it's shared from a trusted source. And finally, if you could leave us a comment or make sure to subscribe to the podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. It helps us continue to bring you this life-changing information and make sure that you get all future podcast updates sent to you. Have a beautiful day and thank you once again.